Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join T2 and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. So, welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Spencer Locker. And me, Tracy Roberts. T-Dog. T-Dog in the house. How are we doing? All right. I'm good. I'm buzzing. Excellent. Halfway down this giant coffee, as always. <laughs> Supped mine. Oh. <sighs> so, That's yeah. Good. First thing in the morning. It is. Our esteemed leader is in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, we better sort of settle ourselves in the in the podcasting suite and uh, have a chinwag. Absolutely. So everything going everything going good with you, yeah? Absolutely. So what's it? what's on your mind today? What are we going to have a chat about? Well, we were we've been recruiting, haven't we? And we've also been talking with a lot of our lovely clients about mm. recruitment and mm. um problems, challenges and also the good stuff that's been coming out of recruitment recently. And mm. it got us talking, didn't it, about what people are looking for, why it's a bit tough. And then it led into a conversation about veterans. <laughs> well, yeah. So it went 360, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. I mean, Talk, well, I think for me, the driving force was between, um, I mean, we were talking about recruitment and, and I suppose re- recruitment and retention. I think you've got to cover, yes. cover both off. But I think that after, uh, for me, the thing that sort of came out with it and, and sort of led me to to look more into it, I suppose, um, from, a, from a current perspective, is that it seems to be an employee's market. Yeah, definitely. But also what, what we're looking for as employers mm. feels different. Yeah. Do you know what I think? Mm. Um, and a lot of the people that we're working with are, you know, maybe in, in two separate positions, depending on what kind of sector they're in, I think. Maybe they're getting inundated with people that have, you know, had some soul searching during COVID and thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do what I actually really like doing rather than what I have been doing. Um, so they're trying to sift through the chaff a little bit and figure out, you know, who's who's best to shortlist and have they got relevant experience or is it worth the pun? Is it the personality? Mm. And then we've got people who are, I don't know, maybe their message has changed during COVID in terms of their business. So actually what they're looking for is different to what they did look for. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I well, I agree. I mean, uh, I think ultimately, and I hate saying the word ultimately, but I, I will do ultimately, I think everybody would would love to be able to do what they want to do rather than what they have to do. Of course. Yeah. And uh, and I think that with obviously post COVID, I say post COVID, it's still going round. Yeah. Um, but well, we um, it. That, it wiped us out the other yeah, way, didn't it? It did. It did. Um, but yeah, I think I think I think a reprioritization, a personal reprioritization for a lot of people, uh, have led to this what what's been termed as a great resignation. Yeah. Um, amongst other things, obviously, it wasn't just exclusively yeah. that. Um, but I think uh, the change in the fact that everybody seems to, I oh, say everybody, a lot of people seem to be scared of change. Yeah. Uh, and we've been in a situation over the past couple of years where change has been foisted upon us. We've had no choice in the matter yeah. in, in a lot of cases. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that's actually given, that's given a lot of people pause for thought where they go well actually i've dealt with this all right what else could i do yeah i think for some people it's built the resilience yeah. for other people it's probably chipped away at a yeah, little bit yeah. depending on the mindset um i guess for me the thing that i reflect on with that is that what covid did or what this period has done to us is it's made a lot of interactions sort of you can pick and choose you know whether you want to be around people or in a situation or in a team hmm rather than being forced to do it like you were previously you know you have to go into the office you have to go and interact and for some people that's a good thing because they're actually they feel like they concentrate or work better remotely or um they like the flexibility whatever it might be for others actually it's really affected them like you know because Mm -hmm. they've realized the strength of actually being in a group of people a high performing group and even that might have been the reason why they've chosen to kind of look for something different because the dynamics have changed i've spoken to quite a few people actually who are almost telling me the opposite from the story we keep hearing which is that you must offer um sorry offer remote working opportunities and you know a lot of companies have even closed offices etc cetera, etc cetera. i've spoken to quite a lot of people you know clients that we've worked with as well that have actually said that they don't feel it's the right thing because actually what they have lost is human contact 
Hmm. So therefore, they've reported that people are leaving the organization because they feel that, they feel the distance. The affinity distance is so big now that actually they feel it's affected their culture. So that's interesting, isn't it? It is. It is interesting. I think um, I, I think the, the thing for that is, is the, the diversity of the workforce. Mm. Um, definitely. we. I think one thing we can all learn from that is we're not all the same. No. We don't all like the same working environment. Um, whereas some people have been have been actually bitten the bullet and sort of went, well, you know what, I, I, I'm more productive in, in isolation, mm. um, but to be in employment, I've got to go into the office. Yeah. And we've yeah. gone through two years of where they've turned around and said work from home and they've gone... Bonus. If you, sorry, you can't <laughs> see, but I'm fist pumping here. Fist, <laughs> yeah. People have gone, yeah, this really suits me. I'm yeah. more productive. I'm more comfortable. And, 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 and they've had a... I, I don't want to say the phrase, um, but I suppose I will do. They've had a taste of the good life. They've had a taste of what suits them, what where they're comfortable, where they're most productive. Mm. And now we're getting to the stage where people are saying, right, bin that off. I mean, some people, obviously, there's three things. <laughs> yeah. There's three things. There's people who continue to work at home and nothing's changed. Mm. There's people who are going, some, some employers we know are going into this hybrid work area where yeah. they're, working from home and working from the office yeah. and there's some or some employers are going no or everybody back in the office yeah. now so obviously there's going to be some people who it suits and they're great and yeah. there's going to be other people who are going to go no not for me yeah and i suppose if you kind of just look at you know so we're, we're kind of conscious of markets and keep an eye on you know what's happening and and particularly with recruitment hr all those things just so we're in line with our content and yeah one of the things i would say is that you, you didn't really used to be able to search for many remote jobs mm -hmm. <laughs> and now it's on the search function mm -hmm. um, and some people like you'll look at a company and you'll think oh that that's a great company and all about that company oh but there's no point looking at that advert because the reality is it's in edinburgh mm -hmm. or, and they all make a point in saying remote so you can work from wherever you want and um, so i think in terms of opportunities it's great but in terms of sort of thinking about the bigger picture and this is the thing that i guess i was kind of alluding to in regards to what people might be looking for and why this might be kind of affecting the great resignation is that some people want to know where they're going to fit don't they mm. so if you are remote I've, I've spoken to a lot of cohorts that have come through recently and they've never met before mm. so they joined either just before covid or in covid and the first time they've actually had a face-to-face -face conversation has been in in our training room. Yeah. Um, and what you know what they've said about the value of that day has been you know tenfold because face-to-face -face contact does make a difference, whatever way you look at it. Mm. Um, so I see where there's that balance, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people have have enjoyed working from home. Mm. I think there'd be a lot of people who would admit to not enjoying working from home as yes. well. Yeah. Um, and you know, it has its place, doesn't mm. it? And it, personally, for myself, I'm a little bit sat on the fence on it. Really, I did enjoy the flexibility in terms of it took the stress away. So what I mean by that is, I have a home to look after. I have, I have a daughter. I have a dog. You know, those things didn't yeah. have to worry so much about those when I was working from mm. home. But what it did add was extra pressure because. You try to get work done and the mm. dog's barking, or you try to homeschool the kid, or whatever yeah. it might be, it was bloody stressful. Mm. And what I would say is, I definitely put more hours in because I go straight back to my desk for my sandwich. Mm. I am there after six o'clock when I'm mm. checking emails. Um, so for me, having the opportunity to do that from time to time is great, but I need to be around people, mm. and that's what you know, that's what makes the job. So, yeah. some of the questions that you ask, you know, when someone says to you in an interview, you've got any questions for us it's interesting even from some of the interviewing we've been doing to get different questions now don't you think yeah so it's been more about you know what is the what is the rigor like here the routine and um, what's the banter like mm. you know those sorts of things and i know it sounds a bit stupid would that have been a big thing previously maybe not a traditional interview question hmm. but i think I, it's interesting that people are interested in that now yeah i think it means it means a lot i think it's more important now um, that 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 sort of relationship and understanding who will fit in the team. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some some organisations are very much the um, you've got all the qualifications. I hope you're going to be a team fit. Yes. Rather than you are a good team fit, let's upskill you. Yeah, and I guess it depends on the percentage, doesn't it? I yeah. always think like if you've got someone. Um, I don't know, it's like internal and external. That's a good debate, isn't it? So if you've got someone internal who's a good fit 
and they're 60 70 percent in skill and you know there's a good will there as well mm. do you take the risk on that person because they've given you their time and their effort and they were a good fit yeah. knowing that you've got that say let's say 30 percent gap to fill mm. or do you bring someone in who's 80 90 in terms of what you want from the outside and take the risk on the 10 percent skill will but also take the risk on the personality fit yeah. And that is a really interesting debate, isn't it? Because mm. it can go either way. I mean, the way the, the kind of environments I've worked in, we've tended to lean more towards trying to, you know, go internal where we can, because it's an opportunity. If people stick with you and people, uh, you know, value the business like you do, and it's their family, so to speak, then I think it usually is worth the risk on someone internal, isn't it? In most cases. Um, but it's not always what you need. You sometimes need a different personality and that's the difference. You sometimes need a different personality to come in because you know the status quo isn't working. You might need a positive or you know, a positive disruptor, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting, because yeah. you've got that loyalty thing there as well, haven't you? If yeah. you're actually coming up through the company, um, I, I've worked with a few recently who have been with the, com- the organisation for quite some time and mm. not necessarily starting at the bottom, but but actually going through a number of iterations, a no, sorry, a number of promotions and yeah. uh, and, and climbing, and it's and you cut them in half, and they've got this yeah. organization cut through, uh, printed through them like a stick of rock. And you've got that loyalty. You don't want to run the risk of compromising that loyalty by going outside. But for the organization to succeed, you might need a certain Sometimes, sort of person yeah. to come in. And as much as that person is loyal mm. and hardworking and, mm. and, and diligent and all this and the other, if they haven't got the the the, the traits that you're looking for for yeah. a particular role, then with the best will in the world. If you have got good a good succession planning situation going on through, right, and it's co- constant coaching in the business, then there should never really be any shock when a job does come up and someone internally applies and uh, you know there should be a bit of a presumption that they understand the 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 level they're at so you should never really if you've got a good coaching culture going on have an opportunity where someone's coming to you saying i want to apply for this internal role and you're saying oh you're nowhere near ready yet because (laughs) they should know that they're nearly there and be working on it or you clearly know because you've had coach conversations and they're not there that actually you can have a very candid conversation with them about the fact that not yet but what you're not saying is no you're saying not now and that's the difference isn't it internally but yeah you're right you're going to have people of course who you're always going to look at them and think from a skills perspective as an example you're a fab and you are like my best salesperson as an example but does that mean that they're going to be a good leader of people Mm, no there's a 50 50 bet there because Mm. not everybody wants to do it and not everyone has natural skills Mm. um so i guess that's maybe where the the line is drawn but interestingly enough one of the biggest indicators of the great resignation is things that people did report they wanted to know things like they can have some flexibility in their work situation predictable schedules things like that and what that tells us and you're a great fan of a schedule and predictability aren't you i am (laughs) I like so, to know where I am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what we're not saying is, you know, it's all about being remote. It's about just people having, feeling understood by the people they work for. That's what mm. I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, and it, it will make it tougher to attract the right people depending on the sector you're in because it's not always doable to be flexible, is mm. it? That's the thing. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> uh, there was one particular organisation we were working with recently and uh one of the one of the things that they were saying because they are they've they've basically gone remote and stayed remote right and one of the things they've said is their recruitment process is is brilliant in the sense that they're always looking for quality employees but now they're not limited by geographic location oh yeah of course yeah so yeah. you've got somebody who might sort of uh, you mentioned edinburgh earlier on mm-hmm. uh, you might have somebody living in edinburgh and this organization that's based in southwest england mm. um want a quality person just because you're already in edinburgh the geographic location doesn't automatically exclude you yeah. if you're the right person for the job you're prepared to work remotely Mm. um then they'll take you mm. uh, well that's it. i'm not obviously i'm not saying that straight away it's not yeah a given, i know what but, you mean. yeah but it's not it, because they're in southwest england they're not limited to southwest england yeah so it's open that's that i guess that probably is adding to the said great resignation isn't it because people are realizing there's more choice so as well as all the things that you know inhibit people um 
you know, growing in a business, um, sometimes it's the obvious stuff like the toxic culture. Sometimes it's it's other elements, the unpredictability. We know that there's a direct link with companies who say they're innovative because people get burnt very quickly in a fast moving mm-hmm. environment. There's a lot of research to back all these things up, but people would have probably stayed in a job longer um, because of geographic kind of requirements yeah. because you know if you've got a family or you're not used to being on the road or all those things that it does it does limit you i mean i've i've been someone who's worked regionally and nationally and it's tough it's tough to keep yourself above water some weeks where you've got to get from aberdeen to right down to london and you've got to cover all these different teams and you've got to be you know fully visual i guess in the business but you know if you were if you were kind of acclimatized to that that's what you did other people used to say to me, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you finish at a club at say five, six o'clock at night and drive to the next place to be mm. ready for the next day and do it all again and then get home on Friday and you're exhausted. And it's, it is hard. Um, so people wouldn't always naturally apply for those types of roles then, would they? But now, now they're more open. They'll open their search a little bit wider when they're looking for opportunities. And it also means there's a little bit of a risk to an employer there, because if there are things that are bothering them, there's no lateral job movement. That's a great opportunity as well, isn't it? You know, people think everyone wants to wants to be the boss. <laughs> it's not <laughs> always the case. They want to try something different in the business. You know, yeah. why not? Um, they will start looking. And as a consequence, it may, sometimes makes it a bit harder for recruiters actually to sift through, doesn't it? Because mm. you're trying not to say, well, I'm not going to look at you. I mean, you've got to look at us as a, as a, a bit of an example of that, haven't you? You know, all of us have got very, very different backgrounds. Mm. I say that most of us are veterans. <laughs> so that's, that led on to that conversation <laughs> this morning. Yeah. But the point I make is in terms of our actual business kind of experience mm. our managerial experience and all those things in Civvy Street, mm. we all come from a slightly different background. Um, and we all agree that on paper, some of us might not have even got through to interview stage. We're we're lucky here that we look be, like beyond that. We mm. want to see a little bit of credentials. We want your CV, but we also want to see what you like on camera, how you interact with people, because that's important, isn't mm. it? Um, I think maybe if that was the case in every job, they'd probably find a lot more talent out there, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, some that's skills a good you've got, to, you've got to ask for, haven't you? You've got to, you know, yeah. if you're an accountant, you can't go, okay, you've got a calculator, you've got a job, you're in. Um, well, yeah, I suppose I suppose um, the, there's your negotiables and your non-negotiables, yeah. isn't there? So, as you said, let's, I mean, I'm not an accountant, but let's just pick up on what you, you say <laughs> about accountancy there. Uh, you've got to have certain qualifications, the, the non-negotiables yeah. to, to, to apply for a certain job in some certain jobs you've got to have certain qualifications yeah. and that's that's it there's no beyond, there's no flexibility there however um in other jobs there's there's a certain amount of flexibility and there's the soft skills things i mean I'm just just to just pull out that what what you just mentioned there you mentioned the v word <laughs> pardon me veterans ah yeah so um w- when we start talking about veterans um both you and i have, have done our time in the military uh, and i think through our experiences we found that there are certain soft skills that are not certified mm. there are there are a lot of things that we do as a matter of course mm. um that's trained into us at right at the beginning of our military careers um and stays with us far longer than some some of our military careers mm. last yeah so um so when we start thinking about that, when we start, it, you might be an employer listening to this and thinking, well, veterans, what, what do, are they, mm. I mean, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Well, obviously I'm always going to be an advocate because I, I know where I came from and I know what I bring. Um, and I think actually now that I know a little bit more about how things have progressed in the forces. I mean, when I had my resettlement, it was okay, but I had to be very self-driven to get what I wanted on the outside. And I had to be brave enough to use the confidence I'd got from being in the forces to actually shove myself in front of the right people. Mm. And a lot of this, this sort of information I got when I was leaving was good in the sense of, you know, use what you know, be confident, use the fact that you're comfortable speaking to rooms of people, you know, all Mm. those things. Um, And all the little edgy things that they taught me that you just wouldn't have thought of. Because obviously I was still quite young when I left. Um, What are you saying? uh, You know, like, (laughs) yeah, exactly. 
get no, i don't mean that i just mean like <laughs> i I'd, I'd sort of like joined at 16 so i was leaving at 23 24 with eight nine years under my belt and i was i was still going out into the big wide world it was like i'd been at uni and i sort of was one a university of life for yeah. sure a university of drinking in some cases um but yeah the fact of the matter is you don't see because you've joined that early you don't necessarily see yourself as other people would see you that's what i would say and i think at any year, age of someone who's joined the forces that could be the case but more so if you join quite early and i had to have someone actually physically say to me are you being serious like let's just write down all the things that you do you know that you've done and when we sort of went back through that lifetime line sort of scenario mm. which is sort of a bit like what we ask people to do when they're thinking about their unconscious motivators to figure out why they ended up like they did now i think about it i thought oh yeah actually i am pretty brave for my age and I am confident talking and I am confident leading and all those things. So actually, once someone actually dragged that out of me, I thought, no, I do feel confident to go in front of people and use my expertise. But I've got to be honest, um, I was sort of fairly pushy, Hmm. (laughs) funny that, Hmm. um, and got myself in front of the right people and just got a leg up because I had this confidence in me that I thought, right, if I just get myself in front of the right person, and show them my tenacity and the fact that I, you know, I have this confidence and I have life experience, even at 23 and all those things. Then I think I'll, within six months, I'll get myself to a senior position. I had that belief in myself. Um, But other people have given me their accounts of when they've gone and sat in front of someone and the fact that the employer has just boo-booed them pretty much from the beginning. Mm. They've, They've agreed that they've got skills because they don't want to be seen to sort of tarnish the kind of veteran's reputation, so to speak. But they're not being able to draw out that kind of cross transferable skills aspect. And for me, that's that's blinkered because the stuff that you get from someone that's left their forces, you've no idea unless you've been in there. But the the, the sense of kind of duty or responsibility that you have, you know, you would be that person for that organization that cut you down the middle and you would be like a sticker rock, like you're saying. Um, they'll be the first ones in, in the morning, last ones there at night, the one to come up with the ideas, you know, they're they're tenacious. They've usually got buckets of confidence and character as well. And then you add into the equation skills, which, you know, depending on what kind of background you've had in the forces, that's next level training that you get, isn't it? Um, Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't walk out of the forces and go, oh, I've been working in intelligence and electronic warfare. I know I'll just go get a civvy job doing that because there's not many people employing for an intelligence specialist in in Hull. (laughs) But what I had to do was think, oh, well, what skills have I used that I can dial up? I'm a bit of a believer in the fact that I don't really like the saying soft skills. I know what you're saying by it, but I just think it's human skills. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, 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 the only reason I've said soft skills yeah. is because that's when where potential employers, when they, when they say, yeah. we say human skills, they wouldn't have a clue or may potentially yeah. wouldn't have a clue. I guess um, what I'm but, trying to say is that, it, you know, some people play that down. Yeah. Like, you know, the fact that you soft skills. And for me, that's what most veterans have in bucket loads. They're very good at dealing with situations, reading people, changing the state, all those things. Because if you just think of just even one of the deployments you were on and a bad day on that on that deployment, and you think of all the emotions you went through in that day and all the adjustments you had to make. And then the first time you were put in charge of a situation, you know, what you had to do, what you had to learn, and what was at stake if you got things wrong. Whereas here, what's the worst? The world doesn't look any different from one day to the next if you make a mistake here really you learn something from it but potentially in the military guess what someone could have died (laughs) so to put it in perspective there's a there's a big there's a big kind of gap there isn't there and i don't think people rate that enough and i think i think that again we can look at that not necessarily from a from a a, a military veteran perspective but from an emergency services perspective as well from um nhs ambulance um the police fire and rescue Mm. uh coast guard that sort of stuff yeah and we we see this in bucket loads don't we because we work really closely with you know the police and and as you said the fire brigade and a lot of other kind of organizations that we just we speak to a lot of their people yeah and we see some and hear some amazing stories and the resilience that they show and the way they can adapt to any situation who does not need that in a business that's what i ask Mm. You know, so if you if you want someone who is determined to progress, the other thing is a lot of people have been in the they've had staying power in some shape or form. Like, 
I don't I don't know what the stats are these days, but the average length of service that I saw when I was there was probably 12, 15 years. But even if you've done five years in a job these days, that's a long time, isn't it? Yeah. So if you've stuck it out and think of all the crap you've had to put up with in that time, that shows that you've got this strength of character and possibly just this strength of, I don't know, purpose maybe as well. So from, from an organizational perspective, you're going to have someone who's going to look at the rules and regs you've got and work with them. Um, but also maybe not feel sort of scared to maybe challenge things from time to time. Because if you didn't do that in the forces, then potentially again, you could have had some issues as well, couldn't I, you? So I, I, I don't know whether they had it in the Navy. Um, I know they've got it in the Army uh, mm. and, and in the Air Force, but if, did did you were you aware of the tenth man rule? I don't you know. know. You, it, you, I might notice something else. So all right, okay. Means. So um, if you were in a room of ten people, yeah, and um, an idea was pitched, or or the, there was a the, a purpose was w- yeah. whatever, and the uh, the nine other people in the room yeah. agreed with it, yeah, it was your duty as the tenth man all person right. <laughs> person yeah. as the tenth person to challenge it from a devil's advocate perspective. Oh, okay. No, I don't think we did do that. So, and, and, and it was that the thing, the thing got me was, um, with, with rigor, rigor was the one one, one word. So, so if, if you're in there, you can't unanimously agree. Yeah. You've got to challenge it. And it's not necessarily trying to put the skids up. Well, it's not trying to put the skids on it or sabotage no, it's it, to but it's at look at it and sort of, sort yeah. of everybody could, it's, it's thorough and it's well thought through and it's, and it, and you, people are sort of questioning themselves and going, right, what could we do differently? So that's the 10th man rule. That was expected. I the- think it sounds very similar to some of the stuff we speak about in terms of like, your commitment aspect mm. from a team. Do you know what a tenth man rule? Let's put that in place now in our yeah. training. I think that's brilliant. I yeah. think if we could all live by that, um, we had something called I think it was called Any Mouse. I think, and if you had an idea or you saw something that you think could have you know need improvement, um, you could pop something in a box and people would consider it. And I think that's slightly more kind of anonymous. Mm. Um, but the idea was there that some people maybe wouldn't speak up because of rank or or whatever it might be. Yeah. Or I don't want to look like I'm overstepping my mark or correcting the captain if you like or whatever mm. it might be. That was a way of getting people to say what they thought, but yeah. maybe not necessarily as as direct mm. as that yeah um but yeah i mean it, it just shows that the reality is there's a lot of lot of reasons why it's you know and it, it is down to personality as we were saying in the beginning back to normal working conditions is this person going to fit with the organization mm. um but a lot of employers will discount someone very very quickly because they've not been in inverted commas civvy street mm. you know yeah. and guess what civvy street's overrated <laughs> Uh, in the sense of you're only going to, you know, I suppose if you look at what organization it is, you're only going to see what you see in that sector sometimes. Mm. And if you're not someone who's a grower who wants to look outside the box and see what's out there and know about other sectors and things like that, all you're going to know is what's in your lane, aren't you? So my argument there is that this is someone coming from an angle where they've seen a lot of stuff go on and they've had to go and search for an opportunity that they like the look of and if they come to you in your organization guess what you stood out above everyone else you know yeah so it's a good thing to consider yeah excellent and 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 i think that's 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 sort of come full circle to our sort of recruitment thing hasn't it yeah where we're now looking for people who are thinking outside the box it's not necessarily quality qualifications but it's that eagerness to learn, that open mindedness, yeah. that um, the um, the the tenacity to actually get hold of something. You turn around and say, "Have you read this? Have you read that?" Because you keep doing that to me. Yeah. Oh, have you read this? Have you read that? <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, I need to read this. Yeah, and I think that's what it's about. It's about challenge, isn't it? Yeah. It's about can that you know the person who comes into the organisation add value, as in it might be scale, it might be qualifications but can they add a different dynamic? Yeah. And I think that's what's interesting. So some of the people we've seen have been brilliant, haven't they? They've yeah. come in and gave great presentations, but some have really stood out because of the angle they've taken and the fact that they are very much a growth mindset person. They're thinking about all these different things all the time. And yet I always chuck things like that at people. I love to be able to stand in a room and even if it's a link to someone that's open source information or someone with a different take on it, I like to challenge it. I like to chuck a grenade in the room from time to time. Yeah. And literally, well, veterans can do that for real, can't they? So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Lovely chat. 
Yeah. Uh, really enjoyed that, Tracy. Thank you very much. As always. So uh, wrapping up, we've come to our 29 minutes. We've talked about, what have we talked about? We've talked about recruitment, retention, yeah. Civvy Street, the military, soft skills, human skills, <laughs> Martin being grenades. in Mexico, grenades. <laughs> yeah, we've covered the lot off there. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Tracy. No worries, um, Well, I, I, I think we've got, we could do another one of these, you know. I think yeah. we need to continue it. Just coffee chats with Spence and Trace. I think it's the new way ahead. <laughs> Excellent. T-Dog, thank you very much. Peace out. Uh, yeah, and until the next time uh, when we come back for another T2 Hubcast, that's me, Spencer Locker, and Tracy Roberts. <laughs>